<laughs> Buenos dias, everybody. Good morning. And uh, this week on Adventures with Sarah, we are continuing our Where in the World programming, where we take you every week to a different destination around the world uh, through interviews and live virtual tours. And this week, we're going to focus on a destination that I actually have never been to. So I'm going to be learning along with all of you. Um, this week, we're going to be visiting Guatemala. Uh, so Reed, of course, is my partner in crime. Good morning, Reed. Good morning. Hola. And where are you at? What mountain are you sitting in front of? Oh, I'm mountain? sitting by Lake Atitlan in the beautiful highlands of Guatemala. Very, very nice. You're getting a good tan. I can tell that you're enjoying your vacation. Yeah, there you go. And then our special guest this morning for Coffee Chat is uh, Diego. I'm going to say Cerveza, but that's wrong. <laughs> even, even good morning, better. Diego. <laughs> Cerezo, Diego Cerezo, who is uh, our Guatemala um, on the ground person. So in each of these countries that we work, if it's not a place that we have a special expertise, like for me, Italy, uh, in other countries where we don't have that kind of on the ground connection, we always find somebody who becomes our on the ground connection, who helps us with reservations and local guides and planning and things. So Diego is our man in Guatemala. So very nice to meet you. We have not met before. Nice to meet you too. Thank you very much for having me. So you're coming to us from uh, Guatemala City, and um, I don't really know much about Guatemala. Like, can you tell us just some quick little facts and figures, size, population, what are the most important things to do and see? What, what are your thoughts about Guatemala? Okay, well, um, I was born and raised in, in Guatemala, uh, especially Guatemala City, or specifically Guatemala City, to uh, a Guatemalan father and an American mother. Um, and uh, basically I lived here most of my, uh, my life. I've also lived in other countries. Uh, I lived in the US for, for about five years and I traveled back and forth. Um, but anyways, Guatemala, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it has a special, um, I have a special love for Guatemala. And one of the things that, that, um, uh, that I think uh, is special about Guatemala is its people. Now, there is a, a very big Mayan or indigenous native uh, population. And it's basically about 60% native Guatemalans and about 40% what we call like Ladinos, which are kind of like European, mixed European and uh, uh, native Guatemalans. Um, so mostly like you look at me and I look uh, white or uh, a little bit American, but I am the minority in Guatemala. Most of the population is, is like I said, native Guatemalans. But the people are so warm, very family oriented. Um, out of the native Guatemalan community, uh, population in general, we're talking about between 16 million, 17 million. And out of those 16, 17 million, uh, it's 60%, what I was saying, which are native Guatemalans. And out of those 60%, there are roughly about 24 to 26 different. Uh, Mayan dialects that are spoken throughout Guatemala. So, for instance, the where Reed is at right now, which I wish I was, I was with you, Reed. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm jealous. Uh, those are the Mayan like Western Highlands, and there's a big concentration of uh, native Guatemalans there. So, from one side of the lake, they speak one uh, native language, and if you go on the boat to the other side of the lake, which is just like an hour. Or a boat ride, they speak another native language. Now, most Guatemalans speak Spanish because that's the official language, so you can kind of like get around. But that's one of the amazing things about Guatemala that you just get out of the central region, like where I'm at, Guatemala City, and you encounter more authentic uh, Guatemala lifestyle and culture. <clears throat> um, and so that's in a nutshell about population. I don't know if you have any like specific questions so I don't, so I don't start talking and talking and talking like for 30 minutes about Guatemala. 
Well, that's why we have you on is so you can talk for uh, an hour about Guatemala. So Reed, um, how, what was your experience like when you visited Guatemala? Well, it was, it was so excellent. And um, I just love it when a, a place surprises me, uh, you know, um, like you, I'm well-traveled and I, you know, I don't want to sound too snobbish about it, um, but it, it takes a lot to impress me. You know, it's, I, I'm not impressed with one more beautiful colonial square or a church or, you know, fortress or castle or, or whatever, or even a beautiful view like, like what's behind me here. Although that's always really nice and breathtaking. But uh, um, like, like Diego was saying, I mean, the, the powerful experience of Guatemala is just the connection with the people. They're just so kind and genuine and, and content, you know? I think we have a, a, a tendency as Americans to think everybody wants to be like us and, and we are wealthy, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of the world. And here's these people that, that have to work very, very hard physically in their lives to just sort of, it's subsistence. It's not, you know, they don't have a great consumer culture like we do. And yet so much more content than Americans. I mean, to try to put it in a nutshell. Um, so it was such a rich cultural connection experience, not so much driven by big sites, although there are a, there's a couple of spectacular things to see. Tikal in the Northeast, right? One of the great uh, Mayan ruins that remains to us. Uh, but that experience of connecting to the culture and just, and feeling enriched, that's, that was my experience. And it, it very pleasantly surprised me. Well, and I think that's an, an important thing that I found in some countries that you've, you've touched on is that um, the people there are just content. And I have to say, I envy it <laughs> when I see people. I mean, I, I feel that about Cambodia, too. I think that's why I have such a sort of strong connection to Cambodia is that I just really admire how people are just they're happy. They don't have, I mean, I remember Luca going into a village in Cambodia and seeing nobody had even electricity. And he's like, they don't play video games here, do they? And I'm like, no. And he goes, huh, but they seem pretty happy, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and that right. is a good, it's a good lesson for all of us to learn. So, um, so when you are in, traveling in, in Guatemala, could you just, just give us a quick overview read of like, what are the things to see? Because like I said, I don't have any information about Guatemala. I don't know what there is to see. Um, how many days would you plan to be there and what would you see? Yeah, well, um, I, I'm gonna want to, uh, Diego to chime in on this too, because um, my experience is, is limited to one tour that we did there. Um, and I was not even very much involved in the creation of it. But I mean, you've basically got Guatemala City where you, you have to fly in there pretty much. That's the one big international airport. And then there's uh, up into the highlands is Antigua, another place that has volcanoes all around it, just a beautiful colonial town. Lake Atitlan, which you see behind me, Tikal that I mentioned before. And I, I have to kind of stop there. So Diego can take it from there. What, to, what would be the typical things that people would come to Guatemala to see other than those four places that I've mentioned? Okay, so um, just to, to compliment what uh, Sarah was saying, she mentioned something about Cambodia. And I did, I had my honeymoon in Southeast Asia. And one of the things that, uh, uh, for those of you that have been to Southeast Asia and have not been to Central America, for instance, for me, that was one of the like very similar like landscapes, culture, uh, obviously very different, but at the same time, you know, poverty um, and culture and friendliness of the people. So a lot of similarities there. Uh, the size of Guatemala, we're talking about a, a small country uh, usually, if you read about Guatemala, they compare it to the size of Tennessee um, as a reference. I, I believe, I'm not 100% sure that the size of Guatemala is 200,000 square meters or square kilometers as a reference. So it's a very small country. Uh, however, it is, there's like a whole bunch of different things that you can do, like rivers, lakes, volcanoes. Uh, uh, cultural things that you can do. So for four first timers, people that are considering visiting Guatemala for the first time and 
maybe they'll not come. It's going it's one of those like once in a lifetime opportunities. Uh, the usual uh, top destinations that people visit that are kind of like musts um, are Antigua, Guatemala, which is in the central region. One, two, three, uno, dos, tres. Right? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It okay. paused. It paused the the video. Paused for a second. I don't know if everything's okay. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, we can see you fine. So Antigua, Guatemala is a colonial uh, town. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it is very close to Guatemala City and the airport. So that's a, a, an excellent uh, hub spot where people can spend some of their days and then travel throughout the country. Um, and then from Antigua, Lake Atitlan, where people can see like beautiful landscapes, um, natural wonders like like the lake and volcanoes and then the actual like native Guatemalan communities that live around the lake um, and I guess the third top destination would be what Reed was saying is Tikal so one of Guatemala one of the slogans of Guatemala which is which is uh, what's the what's the expression in the in the U.S. it's kind of like it it's it hits the nail or on the I head. Yeah. Hits the nail on the head. There's two actually, but the first one is uh, heart of the Mayan world. And we are very fortunate because uh, during the Maya civilization, it was mostly spread out through uh, northeastern or, yeah, northeastern Mexico, like the Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, a little bit of Honduras, but mostly it was. Guatemala was kind of like the center of it. So Tikal is one of the most uh, amazing uh, Mayan sites. And uh, it's, it's a, a big site. It's kind of like one of their main uh, uh, cities. Um, but that's only one of the sites. That's kind of like one of the ones that are the most popular ones. But there are thousands, literally thousands of Mayan ruins spread out throughout, throughout Guatemala. Um, and then the second slogan, which also I think is, is, is quite accurate, is uh, the land of eternal spring. And when people, when people ask me, what do, you, what do you like about Guatemala? What, do, what don't you like about living in Guatemala? Or what do you like about living in the U.S.? What, what didn't you like about living in the U.S.? And, and we try to compare the weather in Guatemala is absolutely fascinating, especially in the central region. So a lot of people also come here because of weather. There's a big expat community. That's, some, that's a, a totally different segment. I know that I'm going, uh, I, I'm, I'm changing the subject a little no, bit. No, no, it's good, it's uh, good. But um, first time visitors, you know, Antigua, Lake Atitlan, uh, Tikal are kind of like the main destinations. Um, but the weather, you said, is eternal spring. So what does that mean? So they call it the land of eternal spring because uh, it's spring-like weather all year round. We basically only have um, a rainy season and dry season, what we call here. But really, the temperatures or the seasons, they're not as marked as some places in the U.S. So for instance, uh, I'm wearing a, a long sleeve shirt right now. Really, this is just so I so I don't look too informal during the interview. But most of the time, I'm wearing a t-shirt or a short shirt, short um, sleeve shirt, and it's extremely comfortable. So what is now, the this is only this is only we're in I'm thinking in um, Celsius, so we're usually 80s. So 80 80s in yeah in Fahrenheit. That sounds very much like where I grew up. I grew up in Southern California and it was always every day of the year, 75 degrees. It didn't matter yeah. if it was Christmas or 4th of July. It was always, always 75 degrees. So what a wonderful place to live. So, so that's, that's one of the, one, that's one of the surprises that when, when I have, when I, when I uh, welcome people or I meet people that are coming here for the first time, when, when I pick them up at the airport, one of their comments is, oh, it's, it's not as hot and humid as I thought it was going to be. However, there are, so a small country, um, 
but very, they're microclimates throughout Guatemala. So the central region, we're at about 1,500 meters above sea level, uh, which is, what would that be, 6,000 feet? No, no, it's approaching 5,000, though. 5,000? Yeah, just, just a bit uh, under. So in the central region, the, the weather is like that all year round. But if you travel south to our Pacific coast, uh, or north to like Tikal and the, the lowlands, then the climate will change and it's a little bit hotter and more tropical. Wow, that sounds pretty darn nice. Uh, so, so the country has so, then everything, mountains, beaches, lakes, all the different kinds of climates then. Yes. And, and what I was saying about the different people that visit Guatemala, there's another yep. segment of, for instance, an expat community from the US, especially or from Canada. And because of the weather, what they do is they spend like half of the year in the US and then during the winter months and, uh, and other months they spend it in Guatemala. Wow, okay. So just to, to take a little, a little pause in the action here, just to make sure that people who are watching, I mean, I, I think a lot of my viewers are more familiar with Europe than they are with Central America and I'm one of them, you know? So I just wanted to pull up real quick. Oh, um, Reed, can you enable screen share, please? Sure. What I want to do is just pull up a quick map to show all of the viewers the, what we're talking about, because it's a really interesting slice of um, slice of territory. So let's have a look here. So Guatemala then is bordered by Mexico, Belize, which is obviously one of um, the top sort of beach destinations. Uh, and then you have Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua to the south. So it's got some pretty prime territory. Um, so I imagine the beaches must be really beautiful, right? Yeah, we have a, a, the, that like northeastern portion close to Belize. We mm -hmm. just have like a small territory which borders or is, is close to the Atlantic Ocean. So yeah. uh, white sand beaches, um, less like waves, more snorkeling type of uh, destinations would be mostly kind of like the Atlantic coast. Um, yeah. And that's more like people that come to Guatemala, they want to extend the trip, they'll go like to Belize or, or maybe Honduras and some of their, their islands to do uh, beach destinations like that. And then one of the unique things that Guatemala has, which attracts a lot of people, are two things. In the Pacific Coast, that long strip of land that we have in the Pacific Coast, this is more black sand, volcanic sand beaches. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with a type of beach like that, this is, it's, it's just a different, different type of sand, obviously. Uh, and the, the waves are a little bit, the currents are a little bit stronger. Um, there's some surfing destinations in Guatemala. So we have some travelers that come to Guatemala for surfing. But one of the things that we're known for mostly, um, and I don't know if Reed uh, knows this, but we are one of the main, the Pacific coast in Guatemala is one of the main top destinations in the world for deep sea fishing. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, I did not know. Sailfish and uh, marlin. We have people that come here, especially like from Florida, United States, that do trips just to come fishing. And fishing is absolutely, it's incredible. Wow, cool. All right, so I hope that everybody who's watching at home gets a little sense of where Guatemala is. And please, if you didn't know where Guatemala is, don't feel bad, because I knew generally where it was, but once you look at it on, on a map, it makes a whole lot more sense. <laughs> So I find that until I visited the place, I generally don't know where it is. And then in the process of going there and, and researching and arriving, and all of a sudden I have a mental map, but uh, it takes time. Yeah. Well, I know, Reed, you have no interest in beaches at all. Of course, that's my first question is tell me about the beaches, but. <laughs> Thank goodness we've got uh, Diego to answer that question. So. Hey, a real quick question that we have from a viewer. Um, good morning, our friend Jerry Kurt, who is one of our usual um, viewers. His question is, what is the national dish of Guatemala? And do you have any special coffee that you drink in the morning? What's the name of the, the person that asked the question, sorry? Jerry. Jerry, all right, Jerry. Let's see, so national dishes, there are, there are quite a few. 
Um, but the main dish, the most popular dish are corn tortillas and beans. And I say this because um, as what I, what I was telling you, you guys before is that Guatemala, one of the unfortunate things about Guatemala is the level of poverty that we have. We have a, a huge uh, amount of people that live under the poverty line. So what can they eat? You know, so they live off of, you know, we, we have a lot of, there's uh, agriculture in Guatemala and our main agricultural, uh, one of the th main agricultural uh, uh, crops is corn. So, so people use that corn to, to make tortillas. And as you can imagine the tortilla, because it's a round uh, um, food, and they, and, and they don't necessarily have silverware. They use that also like to, to uh, as, a, as a cup or as a device to get yeah, other food. Have, yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. like in Ethiopian food where they have the big tor kind of tortilla-like thing and you use it as like a mitt to grab the food, right? Yes. Yeah. And then, so that's, the, that's really one of the beans, corn tortilla, rice chicken. Um, however, most of the, the or uh, most of the uh, villages or towns in Guatemala, for special occasions, they prepare very more elaborate food. And that's usually when people come to Guatemala, that's usually what they try. And it's more of a regional, um, more, more of regional dishes. And mostly they're based of uh, their chicken based um, and, uh, and they have like some other like tam tamales are very, very popular, but most of those foods are more for uh, special celebrations. Um, and then the other question was- uh, Tell us a little question? bit about the coffee and what kind of coffee you drink there, which it's coffee chat, so it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I uh, so another one of the main exports or main crops in Guatemala is coffee, and we're we're known for uh, for coffee the, the for some of the best coffee in the world. Uh, what type of coffee? Now that's an interesting. I am not I am not that into coffee, but there's different types of uh, varieties that are grown throughout Guatemala. Um, and there's actually people that come here specifically to do coffee tours, like wine tours, but they do coffee tours. And there are, because of the elevation of Guatemala, there are plantations or coffee farms that we'll find uh, throughout the, the country, especially in the highlands, that 1500 meters or, or above. So we're very fortunate that we have a lot of coffee. However, we're not usually one of us just drink coffee with sugar or no sugar, but not a lot of like different Starbucks, um, cappuccino or latte or something like that. Viewers um, is mentioning that they make it on the stove with cinnamon in it, in it. Is that a common drink to put cinnamon in your coffee? I never heard of it with cinnamon. Oh, okay, cool. So um, when you say that the, the people come for doing um, coffee tourism, so um, is that kind of a common sort of thing for people to do culinary tours in Guatemala or is that sort of a new thing? Yeah, I think there are people, people do culinary tours in Guatemala. I, I've never been part of one. Um, and, but more specifically, more than culinary tours, they do uh, coffee tours because that we're, we're so well known for coffee and not only people that are uh, coffee and enthusiasts, we have a lot of people that come here that are, that want to specialize a little bit more in coffee and they, they receive like courses or uh, more professional tastings uh, in different regions, more like academic or people that are in the coffee business and want to start importing coffee and they come here to visit some of the different uh, suppliers that we have. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So Reed, tell me a little bit about your experience eating in Guatemala. 
Um, you know, I don't remember any specific dishes that I had, only that the food was good every day. It was, you know, it's that uh, thing we strive for, you know, it's, it's fresh local ingredients that are in season at the time. And of course, as Diego has said, you've got a climate that's sort of the same year round. So food is not seasonal in the same way that we think of it. But I mean, everything was fresh. Everything was freshly prepared. You know, the, if you ordered something that had salsa on it, you know they made it in the kitchen that didn't come out of a jar from San Antonio, Texas. You know, uh, so th that's what I remember. Chicken, rice, um, uh, beef, pork, you know, all kinds of things in, in that sort of Mexican way we think about food. Um, and you know, I, I'm not a foodie, so I wasn't asking about ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. But what I remember was it was good eaten and it was good eaten every day and great value, right? Very, very inexpensive. Cool. And so is there like a street food scene, Diego? I mean, is that part of, because I know a lot of, if you're, if we're speaking about it being like uh, Southeast Asia, street food, I know is a big part of that. Is there a street food scene? Yes, definitely. Um, and most of the, uh, especially if you're, if you're traveling in, in Antigua, Guatemala, uh, there are a lot of local markets. Actually, throughout the country, there are local markets everywhere. And those are some of the main areas where people want to go get more authentic food. Um, and by local markets, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of like municipal markets and they have their own uh, eateries and they have people selling vegetables and, and um, fruits and different types of food. Uh, so... Uh, yes, there's definitely, there's definitely a, a big street food scene. Um, and I would, I would say that's more for uh, the ad adventurous travelers. Um, because <laughs> this is not, this is not like a sit down restaurant type of, type of thing, right? So there, there are people that actually, you know, uh, do that quite often. I, I believe there is... There was a CNN or uh, some program. One of the one of the famous culinary. Uh, what, what's the name? Anthony Bourdain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe, and I could be mistaken, but I believe Anthony Bourdain did one of his shows in Guatemala. Yeah, I, that would make sense. I think he. Yeah. he I, I haven't seen. And it was. Right. It's actually really interesting. Yeah. Huh. So uh, when I've traveled okay. in South America before, one of the concerns that I had and I was very careful about was with food. Uh, I would never drink anything other than bottled water. I wouldn't even brush my teeth with the tap water. And also I, like with street food stuff, I'd never eat anything that had any kind of like fresh vegetables on it or salads, like avoid that kind of stuff. Is that true of Guatemala as well? Yes, definitely. That's why when, when, I, when I was saying about street food, I was saying that's more for the more adventurous traveler. Not that it's bad. Obviously not. It's, 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 it's a really good food, like what Reed, Reed was saying. But you, whenever you're traveling to uh, developing countries um, like Guatemala, they, we have a serious problem with water pollution. So whatever is cooked or made with water that's not, uh, I'm translating from Spanish to English, potable. Yeah, that's correct. Is that a correct term? That's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, a, the, the thing they call it, I don't know if they call it that this down there, but I've, I've heard of Montezuma's Revenge. You've heard of that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why you don't want to drink the water and you don't want to eat a fresh so, salad. And you know what, it's, it's yeah, you, you always want to be careful. That's one of the things that we tell our first time travelers here uh, is just try to avoid um, water or uncooked or foods that might be washed with water that you're buying on the street or ice at like local eateries because you, you just want to make sure that it's uh, purified water to avoid anything. Now, that being said, that's, uh, I mean, we've had travelers, you know, that have never been outside of the US and they're really adventurers and they don't care and they don't get sick. And then we have people that have, have uh, traveled different places and they're very confident that, oh, I'm, I'm immune to, to it because I'm used to it and then they get sick. So it's a, 
there's a little bit of luck into it, but you just want to try to avoid it. And definitely it's something that we always tell our travelers. You don't want to, you don't want to have a, a bad couple of days because you just were a little bit too adventurous. Yeah, for sure. Reed, how, how did it go for you? Um, I don't remember that anybody got sick, but of course the, you know, the memory fails. I'm not, I can't promise that that didn't happen, but I don't remember it being a big issue um, like in some other places, but yes, I do remember get bottled water, be careful for sure. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's just good, good advice anywhere outside of, you know, Europe and North America. I think pretty much everywhere I go, I, I take precautions just because I'd rather not lose half a day feeling, feeling sick. So it's kind of up to you. So Reed, tell me a little bit more about your experience in Guatemala. Well, uh, there's there's lots to tell. Um, uh, I want to start with Tikal because I'm I'm lucky enough to have visited a number of Mayan sites in the Yucatan uh, and a couple other places, so I have a little bit of comparison. And I'm saying that because uh, Tikal was cl is clearly the most impressive to me, um, and I'm going to try to describe why it's. Uh, for starters, the architecture there is, is more vertical than, say, Ushmal or um, Chichen Itza. Uh, you know, th those are impressive places, don't get me wrong, but the, the towers, the pyramids seem to be more vertical, so that, that, that impresses me right away. But I think it's the, it's the setting that is so impressive about Tikal. I mean, you, you have to go through the jungle, either in a Jeep or walking, and you're, I mean, and it's a real jungle. When you're on the Yucatan, I call it scrub jungle, right? It's just, it's, you know, but, but in, in, in Tikal, you expect Tarzan to swing by, you know, it's that, it's that kind of jungle. There's two can, two cans flying by and monkeys and, uh, uh, you know, vines and that sort of thick vegetation from that we think of for jungles in the movies, right? So you're, you're, so imagine that you're walking through the jungle and then suddenly it would seem you know it opens up and you and, and and you're there and there's a couple of those big pyramids very vertical with the uh, um, crests on top um and it's just that moment of reveal you know and, and sarah i know exactly you you know exactly what i'm talking about there's so many sites that we see that that if there's that moment like when you come out of the metro station across from the coliseum or uh you know we can go on and on about those those moments when it's just boom it's present for you and it's almost a surprise that's that's the way i would describe to call um and the other thing i want to say uh and, and anybody who's seen our programming on Peru, uh, we talked about the howler monkeys there in the Amazon basin. Well, my first howler monkey experience was in Tikal back in 1997. That was my first time visiting there. And as we visited the site, every once in a while, you'd hear this growling off in the distance, kind of a low rumbling growl. And honestly, this is the honest truth. I thought they were piping in jaguar sounds. <laughs> <laughs> to, to I don't know spook the tourists or make it seem authentic or whatever I, I totally re I really thought that's what I was hearing but then at the end of the day one of the classic sort of backpacker things that you do is you climb temple number five which is the furthest to the west I believe um and you watch the sunset. That's just sort of a thing you do there, right? You you're able to climb. I don't know if you can even do it anymore, but uh, you know, 25 years ago, you could climb up and sit on the on that uh, pyramid and look across to the others and for sunset. It's just a thing you do. And while we're as soon as the sun went down, the howler monkeys started up in the jungle, and I could not believe the sound I was hearing. If you, if you recall when we talked about it in Peru, I've described it as sounding like a jet airplane taking off. And, you know, that's, you know, and finally somebody told me what I was hearing. I couldn't believe it comes from a little three and a half foot tall monkey, um, just this powerful, powerful noise. And then I realized that that's what I'd been hearing during the day. Not, they weren't really going full throat. They were just sort of mildly a uh, uh, growling, if you will, what I interpreted to be jaguars, uh, <laughs> jaguar sounds, fake jaguar sounds. Um, but anyway, I, it just, it, that was one of those uh, powerful, emotional travel connection moments for me that I'll, I'll never, ever forget. And I, I had that in Tikal. So I got these great sentimental memories of Tikal, but, but just on an objective basis, I really think it's, 
it's a, a, a maybe the best Mayan ruin experience uh, in Central and Central America and the Yucatan. Wow, cool. Do do they have those monkeys in Thailand? I think they do, don't they? Or Cambodia? Because I've heard Our monkeys. I'm not oh. sure, but I've heard monkey sounds, and they don't sound like what you think a monkey's going to sound like. <laughs> They really, I mean, I've never heard the, ooh, ooh, ah, ah. No, they sound, they make scary sounds. Oh. Yeah, no, they do. They make really kind of scary sounds. People think monkeys are adorable. Oh no, they're kind of scary. Every time I've run into monkeys in the wild, I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk the other way now. Okay, and my note says, phone, investigate, investigate monkey sounds, Southeast Asia. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right, sorry, Diego. We got a little, a little sidetracked with monkeys. <laughs> do you have any experience with monkeys? Same as what um, Reed is saying, and uh, I, I, that's that's something. Just I, I've been to to Tikal or the Peten area. The Peten Peten P E T E N. Uh, Guatemala is divided in departments, which would be kind of like counties in the U.S. And we have twenty-two departments. Peten is one of them. And Peten is the largest department. Uh, so Peten is, is mostly forest land. It's, it's a tropical jungle. Um, and I've been there numerous times. And one of the things that Reed's saying, I've been to Tikal, I don't know, I'm going to say 15 times. And every time I go, it's just kind of like one of those breathtaking experiences because it's just magnificent. Um, but when you sleep in and you see monkeys, usually it's in the park, usually you see spider monkeys. And then during specific hours, like the, a sunset tour or a sunrise tour, that's when you can hear the howler monkeys. Usually they're not really there because there's, there, there are people there, but you can hear them miles away because of the, of the big, uh, uh, of the loud sound that they make. And if you sleep in Tikal, uh, like in the, in the middle of the jungle, you're gonna hear them all the time. And yes, that sound sometimes can confuse you. It could be intimidating because it doesn't sound like a monkey. It sounds like a tiger or a jaguar or something like that. Yeah, I just, I don't know where this ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ee thing comes from, like in like our mythology about monkeys. That's not how they sound. They sound scary and intimidating in my experience, but. Maybe that's just Cambodian monkeys because they smoke too many cigarettes. I'm not sure. I, I, I think there are, are mon there are ooh, uh, uh, monkeys out there, right? It's just <laughs> not the howler monkeys. And when Diego says it sounds like a jaguar, it sounds like an angry jaguar with a bullhorn right next to your tent or your, <laughs> your hotel. You really, really, you can't, you've got to experience this, folks. I, I, you know, we could talk about it till we're blue in the face. There's nothing like hearing a howler monkey out in the jungle to just kind of blow your mind. So, cool. You said you have a story to tell. Reed, tell me your story. Oh, just, just I, I was thinking back to when we were talking about coffee earlier. Um, j just that we um, that's a that's a part of the tour that we do there. We we take our groups up into the coffee fields and meet uh, a coffee farmer up there and learn about his life. And oh my gosh, it's labor intensive. You know, when you, it, it's given me a whole new appreciation for a cup of coffee, how the labor that goes into the, the little handful of beans it takes for you to grind and make one cup of coffee. It's just, it, it's a lot. And um, to, to get a little um, glimpse into their lives. And, and this, is, this was one of those moments that made a big impact on me. This, this guy works harder in a day than I've worked in a, in a whole week any at any point in my life i mean he just really and he just was happy and and good natured and and grateful to have the opportunity to have this little coffee farm um you know then we went to where his family does the roasting and we saw that process and how they have to pick through the beans by hand and soak them and and then we all had a cup of coffee together it was just, it was just a great it was one of those really excellent uh cultural connection experiences um, and we learned about his experiences in the Civil War, how he had been conscripted into the army and how he was instructed to shoot at people that he knew were his neighbors and his friends. I mean, it was 
it was it was heart wrenching, right? To to hear this story of of how the the civil war unfolded there in Guatemala and and how it ripped their culture apart. I mean, it, except that it be, then becomes a backdrop to this guy who's just you can understand a little better why he's so happy just cultivating his coffee and the hard work that he has to do because his his life is peaceful. He doesn't have to shoot at his neighbors anymore. Uh, you know, it was just just a powerful, powerful experience all the way around, which which culminated, by the way, when we were up on the slopes of the volcano where the where the coffee grows with the local women bringing us a picnic. Right. So we we had the the tortillas and beans and rice and, you know, just a, a classic local lunch, but lovingly served and just, you know, I just, my heart swells when I think about the experience of those people. So um, Diego, when you're putting together um, tours, um, how do you put together your local experiences? Because I know that Reed and I really prize those interactions that are genuine. Like, I mean, I'm thinking, um, when we're in Thailand, we have people cook us lunch and take us on a bike ride, you know, it's just these kinds of things where you actually do that. I think they're the holy grail of travel personally. Um, so what are the, the experiences you're able to put together for people where you really feel like they're meeting uh, the culture? Sure. So um, one of the reasons uh, that I decided to start uh, this business, one of the many reasons, but one of the main reasons um, was uh, trying to do a business that also had a social impact. And uh, one of the things that we, we do with all of our travel programs is we make sure that we're benefiting, uh, you know, the local artisan or the local uh, boat guy that lives at the lake or the local cooperative of Mayan women, textile makers, the, you name it, or the local coffee farmer uh, that has a small little like patch of land and, and he wants to do a little tour. So a lot of these people, one of the, one of the, the, the ways that tourism has benefited them is um, through some of these uh, programs. And you would think that this has been the case for a long time, but it's actually uh, another way that they, they, they've been um, uh, trying to survive or make, a, make extra money. So for instance, um, um, there are many things that we do. And again, it depends on the, it depends on the, of the program, but the, the different experiences like we have culinary experiences. So we'll do a tour at a coffee farm with a local farmer. And then once he, uh, he tells us a little bit of the story of the coffee and, uh, and how he produces it, we'll go to his house and his wife or family will cook a homemade meal. And and you're having like an authentic homemade meal at their house. And it's, it's, it's just uh, a, a, an awesome experience. We have, uh, we'll go to the lake. And for instance, one of the towns at the lake is known for its pottery and ceramics. Um, so we'll actually go to one of the houses of the people that, of the artisan that does ceramics and we'll have a, a little workshop with him or her uh, about the ceramics. Um, we can do homestays where people are, are, you know, we're usually staying at different hotels, but maybe a couple of days from the tour, we'll, we'll stay with the local Guatemalan family. Uh, which is always a, a, an eye-opening experience. Um, what other things? Uh... I had a question, uh, or there's a little conversation going on in the, um, the comments section about uh, textiles. Uh, do you have any kind of experiences of, of getting people involved with watching how they make the textiles? Yes, I know that, was, that was the good. other one. That was the other one I was thinking of right now. Yeah. Um, we also do textile, that's a, that's a big, uh, uh, that's a popular one. 
And so we'll choose, like we want to, we try to avoid because you also have kind of like tourist traps. Yes, sir. Right. That, you know, they'll, they'll like at some of the hotels, they'll, they'll hire some of the native uh, women that are really good and they'll have her kind of like doing textiles at the hotel, which is okay. She's making a living and it's authentic, but it's, it's, uh, it's not as authentic. So we, we try to look for uh, opportunities where we're actually going to the towns and to some of the cooperatives and actually like uh, helping them. And we have activities where we go to, to, to their houses and they'll have a demonstration of how they make the, the textiles, which is very intricate. And it's a hands-on experience and people that really like that they can participate. Uh, will after the, the presentation, we'll make tortillas uh, or we'll make ground coffee, like the authentic uh, Mayan way. So okay. those are like small, and then people there, then we have like small little experiences like that. But then every now and then we also have people that, you know, for instance, say, wow, I, I want to learn how to do these textiles. And they actually come specifically for workshops to learn how to do it. So they're longer workshops and they're just concentrating on on learning how to do textiles, for instance. I think there's something so satisfying about that too, because I've done workshops kind of like that where you make something, you know, there's so many different places in the world you can go and you can learn a craft like that. And that's so rewarding somehow. I don't know, it massages a part of your brain that maybe we're not in touch with in the United States. I'm not sure. So that's really cool that you do those different kinds and, of things. Reed, what is and, your experience? And there's, there's, sorry, there's, there's a whole bunch of things. I'm probably forgetting uh, a whole bunch, but another, another popular thing that we do is a lot of volunteer work. That's a very common, that's a very common segment. Mm -hmm. So we have people that want to come here and help, whether it's uh, maybe a cooperative or a town with textiles or a local coffee farmer, or they want to paint a school or um, they want to build a playground. I mean, you name it. There's a whole bunch of opportunities that, that, are, that, that are available, depending on what people want to do. So that's something you can arrange if, if people want to have um, volunteer work as a part of their trip. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so Reed, what is the spin you put on your tour that you're doing of Guatemala? Well, I mean, this is, this is perfectly appropriate right now because um, I, I can say without, without qualification, without hesitation, that the Guatemala tour that we put together is, is more about cultural connections and is and every day we're doing something like all those things that Diego was talking about every single day on the tour um, it, uh, to finish the thought more than any other tour that I do anywhere else in the world the Guatemala tour is that hands-on experiential connection to the culture and and working with Diego and then with our, our good friend and colleague Steve Smith who has uh, deep connections to Guatemalan culture we were really able to cross that line between sort of the commercial tourism experience and the genuine connection experience so you know we had the coffee farm visit we went and visited uh, a textile outfit where the women were you know walking us through what they were doing uh, a, an artisan who did some painting uh, we had had, uh, lunch in a village where we uh, got to meet the people who were building a school there and then they took us and we had lunch with the village women we had dinner in the home of Steve's daughter's host family from when she had been in Guatemala it's you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, you know my comment is is more universal that that the tour that we put together for Guatemala is is really all about the things that we've been talking about the last five six minutes here wow that's great all right, so um, just to kind of wrap up, so as far as, as Guatemala goes, kind of the highlights that we have are the cultural interactions for sure. Uh, the food, which is rustic, but kind of homemade good stuff, right? And then the natural experiences, which we didn't talk too much about, but the, and also the, the, the ruins. Um, the, could you just basically spend an entire trip focused on that aspect if you were interested in just the, the ancient cultures? Yes. So uh, we call, I mean, we call that kind of like specialty trips. Mm -hmm. So um, 
there are travelers from all over the world that uh, might want to come just specifically for uh, deep sea fishing, for instance. Mm -hmm. And um, arc, um, Mayan archaeology is one of the top ones. Uh, so Mayan archaeology, like what I was telling you guys at the beginning, Tikal is, you know, kind of like the, the must if you're just going to be here for, for one time. But if you're into Mayan history or Mayan archaeology, uh, you will, you, you're going to visit, you can visit 10, 15, 20 different sites of different stages of Mayan civilization. And everything is kind of like close by. Um, so you, we have groups that just do like, uh, you know, three or four different sites of the popular sites. And then you have more specialized academic trips like universities or, or students that come here and stay here for a month or two months or three months and they're working at different sites. Um, wow. That's just my archaeology. Um, but there's, 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 there's a whole bunch of other different segments for bird watching. Bird watching is a big segment. Wow. A lot of people come to Guatemala just for bird watching. I mean, and when I say just, it's, I mean, that's the focus of the trip, but obviously you're also doing other things during the trip, but that's the, the main focus. Coffee, um, volunteer, volunteerism. Um, and, and so there's a lot of variety. That's, oh, that's nature, nature. For instance, you were talking about nature, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, like more natural wonders. Yeah. Uh, we have 32, 33 volcanoes in Guatemala. Wow. We and have people that come one. here. There's an active one, isn't there? We have, there are many active ones. Yeah. This one was smoking behind me when I was there. Wow, very cool. Uh, so we have people that come here just to do hiking. Wow. Diego, forgive me for jumping in here. Do you, now I, I, you set my whole group up. Do you work with individuals in, in your business or do you leave that to like travel agents and stuff? Yes, we, we have requests. Now, uh, we are a destination management company and uh, we basically, our specialty is just tailoring trips based on you know, the preferences and needs of each group or individual travel. And we receive requests like for group trips. You know, when I say group trips, you know, 10, 15, 20 people that it's more, it's a more organized trip. And we also have people that contact us uh, that it's one traveler, two travelers, a couple, uh, maybe a family. Let's get that want, uh, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah. um, what is what is your your company called, and how would people who yeah. are watching contact? Before you? we sign off, let's 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 get the name of your company out there. What uh, what what's it called? It's DMC Guatemala. I'll write this down. DMC standing for Destination Management Company, and. Um, the website is dmcgt.com. Cool. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and put that into the, um, the video. So all of you who are out there watching, if you want to have some help arranging a tour to Guatemala, um, you can contact Diego. Uh, also, Reed is offering a Guatemala tour. Is it this year or next year? I, I, there was some discussion of trying to put it together this year, but I think that's it's just a little too quick for people to uh, uh, in the post- COVID world. So for sure, 2022, again, Steve will be taking a group down there again. Excellent. So if you guys think that Guatemala would be a great destination to go and explore, um, you have two excellent contacts. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, um, Diego. It's so nice to meet you. Uh, and thank you, Reed, as always, coming to us live from <laughs> in front of a volcano. <laughs> so uh, all this week, we're going to be um, focusing on Guatemala. Please, Reed, tell us what the other events we have going on this week are. Well, just a couple. Uh, um, on Wednesday, we're doing another coffee chat, and we will have Steve Smith that I've mentioned a couple of times and his adopted Guatemalan daughter, Maria, who's now a college student at Oregon State. 
Um, she, the two of them helped me organize that trip that we did along with Diego, we put together a great experience. So we're going to talk again about Guatemala, but it'll, it'll be more, uh, more of a deep dive into those, those great cultural connection experiences that I was waxing on about. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, William Rosenden is going to join us, a colleague of Sarah's and mine that uh, was also part of that trip. Um, he'll, he'll add his perspective. Uh, and then we're furiously trying to put together a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, to do uh, at the end of the week. So a, a light week of Guatemala, one more coffee chat and uh, PowerPoint will finish off the week. And I'll be mixing in some travel skills stuff. Uh, my famous shoe uh, information for travel shoes will be this week. And also I'm going on a mystery adventure. So uh, Reed, you're going to be flying solo on Friday because I'm getting on an airplane and I'm going somewhere interesting. So uh, there's going to be some fun new uh, content and I'll just give you guys a hint. It will be a culture I am not very familiar with. So that's going to be coming up starting on Friday. So uh, leading up to that, I'm going to have some packing stuff uh, going for you guys. So lots of fun things happening this week. So thank you so much, both of you for joining us today. And we will see you again soon. Okay. Adios. Adios. Gracias.